In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. I know that I am on record objecting to the alarming frequency with which we hear this gospel, especially considering there are plenty of passages, beautiful passages from the gospels that never appear on a Saturday or a Sunday. But I'm willing to revisit that opinion given our current circumstances. By any measure, it has been a hellish year. And if we're not thinking about the pandemic, the virus, which has brought illness and death, and not only that, but mental illness and anxiety and unemployment, isolation, all manner of difficulties. We've had a year of horrible events, earthquakes and floods and fires and acts of terrorism and horrible racism. We've had tumultuous politics and rioting. We've had all kinds of things, including the revival of ancient heresies under the guise of traditionalism and piety in the Orthodox Church. So if we were to take all of these horrible things and wrap them up and depict them in one figure, it might look indeed like this, a naked, crazy man running about the tombs outside of a city terrorizing anybody who comes by. And every time you lock him down and you think you have him under control, he breaks free only to wreak, wreak more terror upon people. And the simple and straightforward meaning of this gospel is that Jesus comes to such a one and defeats all of the dark powers. And the beautiful image that we have depicted in this gospel of that man who had suffered so greatly and caused such suffering, this beautiful image of him sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, attending to the word of God, gives us great hope, gives us the message ultimately that Jesus has indeed come and faced and defeated the dark powers. It's telling in this gospel that the devils are called legion because in the gospel, as we've already seen, Jesus has defeated death and illness and cast out demons. And here represented symbolically in the name legion, we of course have the dark oppressive powers, the politics and evil authorities of this world. Legion calls to mind the Roman authority which had brought great suffering to the majority of the people. Of course, there were those who benefited from the Roman occupation, politicians and tax collectors, and of course, prostitutes and pig farmers among them, supplying the legion with their food and other goods. But our Lord comes here and as the people wish, drives legion into the sea. And it is at the name of Jesus that this occurs. The devils themselves recognize Jesus. Only ones in the whole gospel who really know who he is, they call him Jesus, the son of the most high, Yeshua ben El Elyon. And we know that Jesus will come and has come and defeats the dark powers. But it is not nearly so straightforward even in this gospel. Because as we see at the end, even as this man is healed, even as this man is brought to his right mind and is able to hear the word of God and is sent back to his home to proclaim and preach the gospel, a home he didn't have previously, a home from which he had been isolated and cut off. Even as all this is occurring, the people rise up in fear and they reject the Lord. Clearly, there are those who don't want this to happen. This image of, of utter peace and blessedness, of wholeness, of shalom that this man represents, they get afraid of it, and they decide that they want to reject that. They would prefer the world of the dark powers. And as difficult as it is for us to understand, this continues to be the case. Not everyone seeks the peace and blessedness and wholeness that Christ offers. There are those who are going to resist it. 
And so though, although the war is won, the battles, the skirmishes continue as we fight the resistance of those who are opposed to what Christ brings, to that wholeness, that blessedness, that peace. The other complication, as it were, to this story is that the life of this man, the naked man, muttering strange things amidst the tombs on the outskirts of the city, recalls another one who is headed in precisely that direction. In only a chapter, the Lord Jesus will say, I need to go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man must be given up and must suffer and must die. And there will be a point at which he is on the outskirts of the city, naked and stripped and beaten and suffering and muttering strange things that only those ultimately who will open the scriptures and have the scriptures open to them will understand. And so the road to this blessedness, this wholeness, this peace that Christ brings is indeed a road that leads through the cross. It's funny that the demons here ask not to be cast into the abyss. But of course, that is precisely where Christ must go. And those of us who will follow Christ must go with him. And it's not a simple matter of snapping our fingers and going from the suffering of the world around us into this blessedness, this peace, this shalom. We must follow the path of Christ. We must confront the dark powers. We must descend with him in order to arise again. And we must confront also those who are opposed to any of those things taking place. But nevertheless, amidst all of the things that we are going through and the things which are yet to come, who knows what this coming week will bring south of the border and beyond, but we must be encouraged by this gospel. We must be encouraged that ultimately the whole world will sit at the feet of the Lord in its right mind, clothed and made right with God. We must hear the words of the Apostle Paul who writes to the Philippians that God has exalted Jesus, highly exalted him, that he has given him a name above all names, that at that name, the name of Jesus, as we heard in the gospel, Jesus, the son of the most high God, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and below the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.